my name is Toshko Ichie. I'm from Georgetown University. And I'd like to talk to you today about the mystery of life in extreme environments. And I'd like to talk to you about it from a point of view, the molecules that are involved. Uh, let's see. And my apologies to you. This talk will be in English because your English is much better than my Japanese. <laughs> So, um, as you all probably know, life has been found in amazing extreme conditions. So, over on, here on the left are snailfish, and these things live at eight kilometers below sea, sea level. That corresponds to a pressure of 800 times atmospheric pressure. That's a lot of pressure. These things uh, live in the Mariana Trench. So the Mariana Trench is south of Japan, and this is the deepest ocean trench. Um, also, life has been found. Um, this is a Pompeii worm, which grows at 45 to 60 degrees Celsius, um, but it actually can survive at 105 degrees Celsius for a short period of time. Um, and these are found in hydrothermal vents, uh, a black chimney, like uh, the previous uh, speaker talked about. Okay, so um, why are we interested in life in extremes? Well, uh, many people are interested in the origin of life, and as our previous speaker said, um, many people think that um, it began in hydrothermal vents. Um, people are also interested in looking for extraterrestrial terrestrial life, looking for life on other planets, or uh, moons. Uh, this is a picture of Jupiter's moon Europa. And there's uh, oceans um, on Europa, and there may be life there. Um, but we want to know what kind of conditions that um, temperature, pressure, that you could find life. Um, it's also important for understanding for climate change, because with climate change, uh, if you change the temperatures and pressures, you may kill some animals or, or other organisms, or uh, organisms from other environments may come into uh, contact with us. Okay, so I showed you pictures of uh, animals and higher organisms. But when people think about um, understanding where life can live, they often look at microbes or um, prokaryotes, single cell animals, because they live in very, um, the, the most extreme environments. So um, in this diagram, we have pressure versus temperature, um, also salt country concentration, but I'm going to concentrate on pressure and temperature. Um, the highest pressures that organisms have been found at are in the deep sea. So around a thousand times atmospheric pressure, a thousand times normal pressure. And they're found um, all the way from um, temperatures near zero degrees all the way up to about 100 degrees Celsius. And so far, the maximum uh, temperature that uh, they've been found at is um, found to grow at is 120 degrees Celsius. And the maximum pressure is around um, 1,100 times atmospheric pressure. But this is just based on where we have found life. So what we're interested in is not only what has been found, but can we predict where life could be found? Because, well, there's, uh, we might not look, or if we're trying to think about other planets, we, don't, we want to know where to look. So extremophiles are organisms that live in extreme conditions. And um, 
in order for an extremophile to grow, live and grow, their cells must work. But if you look at a cell from a, an extremophile, they look a lot like cells from organisms that live at the surface. They look like normal cells. And if we look inside this cell, the proteins that, make, that work inside the cell, they also have to work properly in order for them to grow. But if you look at them, they look just like proteins pretty much from surface organisms. So something has to be different because they're surviving at pr pressures temperatures that we couldn't. So what we're interested in is what I call the material science of enzymes. So enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions. They're a type of protein. And in order for enzymes to work, they have to have two things. One is they have to have a stable structure and the other thing they have to have is flexibility. So the structure is just the arrangement of the molecules. But here, the flexibility corresponds to motion. So these things move around. This motion that you see here is, is um, what you would call Brownian motion. So um, you may remember there was um, Robert Brown looked at pollen suspended in water under a microscope, and he saw that the pollen was jiggling around. That's the same kind of motion that's here. And you look at that, and why is it important? It's because that's the kind of motion that allows proteins to change shape during the course of when they're performing, catalyzing their reactions. OK, when I say material properties of proteins, what I'm, actually, what I'm interested in understanding is how the stability, like maintaining the structure, and the flexibility of enzymes are affected by temperature and pressure. And also, how enzymes from extremophiles are changed or adapted so that they can live at the extreme temperatures and pressures. OK, we all have an intuition about what happens at different temperatures. So these are gummy bears into gelatin candy. And at normal temperatures, huh, they're kind of squishy. <laughs> they, you know, they move. If you cool it, say, to zero degrees Celsius, they get hard. They get rigid. If you heat them up above maybe 35 degrees Celsius, they melt. That's similar to what proteins do at a molecular level. So at 25 degrees Celsius, they kind of move around like that movie I showed you. They just kind of, if you cool it down, they get less flexible, they stop moving, and they get rigid. You heat them up, they melt. They unfold. So they no longer have this structure. They're all, they're melted. Different proteins melt at different temperatures. It's uh, usually above 41 degrees Celsius, but um, yeah, different, it's different for different proteins. We have less of an intuition about what happens to things under pressure. This is a giant gummy bear at atmospheric pressure. If you put it under pressure, when you start pressing, uh, by the way, this is from YouTube. <laughs> Um, if you start pressing on it, it starts to get compressed. And if you keep on pressing on it more, and this is at 250 atmosphere, it gets squashed. That's actually similar to what happens to proteins under pressure. If you press on it, and this is up, actually um, up to about 600 atmospheres, it gets compressed. And so it gets more rigid. You press on it more, and it squashes. 
it unfolds. It's, um, this is usually um, above 2,000 atmospheres. Some are, some proteins, you know, 10,000 atmospheres. Um, and there's actually a process that's called pressure-induced unfolding, where these molecules unfold. Um, you might notice, actually, that what happens is that when you put smaller pressures on it, it's sort of similar to cooling because it becomes less flexible. But then when you put more pressure on it, it's actually similar to heating because it unfolds. OK. So what we're, we've been trying to do is under, um, understanding how enzymes from extremophiles adapt so they don't suffer the effects of the extreme temperatures and pressures. And in order to understand that, this, um, there's something that we call the corresponding states hypothesis. And the idea of this is that, well, first of all, homologous enzymes are basically the same enzyme, but from different organisms. And by the same, I mean they perform the same function. They have about the same structure, but they differ slightly chemically be between organism to organism. The idea and the corresponding states of the enzymes are actually the growth temperature and the growth pressure of the organism from which they came. So it's not, so it's like, um, it's where that the microbe or the organism, where it grows best. And the idea is that homologous enzymes have the same activity at their corresponding states. So you would expect um, an enzyme to, at the growth temperature of the organism and growth pressure would act just like another enzyme when it's supposed to be optimal. And because of that, because you need both stability and flexibility to grow, the stability and the flexibility should be the same at the corresponding states. So the method that we actually use to look at this question as are called molecular dynamics computer simulations. So we do um, simulations, much like a flight simulator or a driving simulator, is simulating um, what we think about is the way they behave. And in order to do this, we start off with the positions of every single one of these atoms for the protein and also the solution around it. So. We've been looking at a small protein, but this is at least, it's over 32,000 atoms, so a lot of atoms. And then we take Newton's second law of motion, force is equal to mass time acceleration. And we use Newton's law to, so to solve how the positions of those atoms, those over 32,000 atoms change as a function of time. So we do it over and over and over again. And the result is, actually, we can make a movie out of it. This is the result. So um, each of these atoms is moving. We get it from doing this. But because we have so many atoms, so because we have so many atoms, and we have to do this for very many frames, basically, we have to use high power supercomputers to do this. Um, and so, yeah, the, this is a, in the US, it's a high power supercomputing facility. So actually, so what I'm showing you here is a movie, but we can actually use that movie, uh, we can analyze that movie as if it was the real thing. So what have we learned? Well, first, what high temperature does to a protein is it breaks hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are what hold a protein into its three-dimensional shape. So and here I show hydrogen bonds 
in an alpha helix that are holding the alpha helix together. And um, so proteins are held together by hydrogen bonds. Um, and hydrogen bonds are kind of like staples that hold, just hold just different parts of the um, protein together. And just like if you think of adding staples, more hydrogens bonds make the protein more stable because you have it's more bonded, um, but it makes it less flexible because it's constrained by the hydrogen bonds. Fewer hydrogen bonds, conversely, make the protein more flexible but less stable. And so for the protein to work, you need to balance flexibility and stability. What have we learned about pressure? High pressure, as you imagine, compresses proteins. So proteins actually have a lot of holes inside of them. They're not solid. So this is a, a diagram of a protein where this is, uh, these blue things are the holes inside of the protein. And so bigger holes, and also, yeah, you could make an analogy like a sponge has holes on it. And because if you have bigger holes, it's going to be more compressible. But if you have bigger holes, it will be less stable because the holes get, make it uh, not as strong. Um, also, if you have, conversely, smaller cavities make the protein more stable, but they make it less compressible. So again, you need to have a balance between stability and compressibility. Okay, so how do the proteins, we, we really want to know is how do the proteins from these extremophiles adapt for temperature and pressure? And so to do this, we have to think about this, these balances that have to go on. So what I show here is this is um, the temperature of where the organism grows, and this is uh, pressure. I have it pointing downward because we can think of it as going down from sea level. And, um, and I'm talking about, so I'm talking about proteins from different organisms. So a mesophile is a, that uh, could be any organism that uh, lives under normal conditions, sea level, uh, moderate temperatures. And if we compare a protein from a mesophile with one from a thermophile, a thermophile is a microbe that lives at high temperatures, hot loving. And um, so, you know, maybe 100 degrees Celsius. Um, at sea level, what it's, the difference between the, these two proteins is going to be that these proteins will have more hydrogen bonds to make them more stable to, so they don't melt. If you compare, compare in, uh, excuse me, compare instead a protein from a mesophile with a psychrophile, and a psychrophile is something that lives in cold. You, uh, you know, conversely, these proteins have fewer hydrogen bonds. Then if you think of going uh, to higher pressures, to something called a piezothermophile, which would be pressure and high temperature loving, you're going to have more hydrogen bonds because it's in the heat, and you're going to have bigger cavities, so it can be compressed. Um, also, when you have a, if you think of going from a mesophile to a piezocyclophile, so high pressure and cold temperature, you're going to have fewer hydrogen bonds and bigger cavities. But if you think about it, there, in, in both the hydrogen bonds and the cavities, there is a balance between compressibility and stability, between flexibility and stability. So these are the, this is the most unstable combination you can have. Few hydrogen bonds and, and large cavities. It's like having few staples and big holes.
So what does this mean about the limits of life? And limits of life mean you know, what are the limiting conditions that you can expect for life? Well, pretty much um, for life as we know it, we think water has to be a liquid. And in this diagram here, so this region up here is the vapor phase. Uh, so it's all, water's a gas. Over here, water is ice. But it's liquid in this dark blue region. Um, and that, so as you get to higher pressures, you actually, water freezes at a lower temperature. And at a, as you get deeper also, it vaporizes. Um, at a higher temperature. Um, so life so far has been found pretty much everywhere from almost freezing to boiling and from one to a thousand times atmospheres. So where, where could we find it? Where do we think we could find it? Where, it, where we haven't found it so far. Well, actually, if we think about going either deeper or lower temperature in this direction, deep and cold, that's actually pretty hard because the proteins there are already very unstable. They don't have many hydrogen bonds, and they have big holes in them. So if you make it so they adapt to those lower temperatures and at High pressure, at high pressure, there's nothing holding, left holding them together. But if you think of these, this direction, so that in this direction, if you remember, the proteins have lots of hydrogen bonds, and they have big cavities, but you can compensate hydrogen bonds and big cavities. So we think it's possible that you could go both deeper and hotter. Because you could add, if you add a, a little bit more hydrogen bonds, you can add maybe a little bit more holes and just maintain the balance. And so what we're interested in doing now is trying to see how many extra hydrogen bonds we can add and how many holes we can add. And so can we actually predict what that lower limit is. Because you know, if you think of the hydrogen bonds as staples, you, you can only add so many staples before you connected everything. Also with the holes, you can only add so many holes. So how many, we're looking to see how many you can add. Okay, so um, in setting extremophiles, as you may have gathered, involves um, many different kinds of science. Biology, microbiology, biochemistry, chemistry, biophysics, physics. It also involves experiment and computation. I'm very lucky that I don't have to do all of this myself. I couldn't do it all myself. And so um, I have many collaborators all over the world who work on different parts of the problem, different kinds of things. And that's actually one of the most interesting and satisfying um, aspects of this because so many different fields are coming together with their own viewpoints and thinking about this problem. And we're all you know, talking to each other about the problem. And um, for those of you who may be thinking about going into science in the future. Well, I've talked about um, extreme files for extreme temperature and pressure, but there are many, many types of extreme files. For instance, there's um, what it called acidophiles, things that live in high acid em environments. This is a bacteria that actually um, causes ulcers. It's, it lives in your stomach. Um, this are um, uh, alkophiles, are ones that live in highly alkaline environments. Um, this is a picture of blue-green algae. Um, this is uh, a 
It's called a sea monkey, and it lives in a high salt environment. This thing is a tardigrade, um, and Nick, uh, sometimes called water bears. This is actually a real animal. <laughs> it's um, about half a millimeter uh, in size, but they're real. It kind of looks like a, <laughs> I don't know, it doesn't look real. <laughs> Um, and they, they live in many different extremes, high temperatures, high pressure. They, they can be desiccated. Uh, you can remove them from water. Uh, they're very radiation resistant. They're, they're amazing creatures. And this purple thing over here um, is a bacteria that comes from eight, um, sorry, three kilometers below the Earth's surface. In mud, it's not in the ocean, it's living in mud. And uh, this is from three kilometers. I think the record now is five kilometers below the Earth's surface, through five kilometers of mud, and it's still able to live and um, survive. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, in addition, um, these, my, many of the extremophiles have very interesting uh, metabolisms. So, the, um, for instance, lithotropes, lithotrope means rock eater. They literally eat rocks. Uh, so these are examples. There is a lot of interest in biotechnology about um, these lithotropes because for energy sources. And um, talking about biotechnology, um, this is from the New York Times one month ago. They have been able to make cyanobacteria. These bacteria uh, make living concrete. So um, they take cyanobacteria and sand and shake it up together, and they make these bricks. So I hope I've convinced you that um, extremophiles are a fascinating window on life. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, just。先生どうもありがとうございます。えっと、それじゃあまた会場からですね、質問を募りたいと思います。あの、質問は日本語で do you have to translate it? No, I don't. Nihongo, they are no stimo salatemo ino de, ano, de he, a kirakuni. Ano, de he, whatever she has stimo stai to Hito Ereba, no, what I should tell me, she must say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't じゃあ、とりあえずお待ちください。ちょっとしばらくお待ちください。オッケー。あ、どうぞお願いします。えっとですね、今、ま、タンパク質のお話をされたと思うんですけど、あの、特にあの、安定性とま、自由度の バランスの関係ですね。それをお話されたと思うんですけど、そのま、各さ、あの、最初の生命はあの、例えばRNAワールドみたいな言葉がありますけど、各さんの世界とま、タンパクを使ってるマシーナリーがなんか融合して、ま
Okay. Um, actually, I, that is, um, I think that's right, that it, life evolved in uh, high, temp high temperature, probably actually high pressure conditions. And so if you look at this picture, we think life evolved probably up this way, across this way, and down that way. And if you look at the, um, so we think um, evolving this way is not such a uh, difficult evolution because you're going from high pressure to low pressure. So it's easy. This way, it's not so hard either. This way, you have a few adaptations. But here, what you just is, you randomly, it's actually, uh, I think it's an important consideration whether you evolve this way or that way. This way, you, you just lose random hydrogen bonds. If you are trying to move downward, you um, have to have specific hydrogen bonds. Also, if you move this way, you just lose random hydrogen bonds. This way, you have to make specific interactions. So it's a very important question. It, I didn't talk about it here, but I, I, that's actually, I think, an important question. Um, hello, so I'm still a high school student, and I just want to, um, I guess this will be a very simple question. So, like, I remember for extreme low fields, you talked about how cells and proteins are similar to what we call the normal ones. And then you talked about how enzymes also kind of, like, collaborate with these um, microbiotics. But... I remember from my biology class, we, like, we, yes, human ourselves also has um, enzymes, but is it really just the structure of the enzymes that, like, kind of makes different from the ext extremophiles that can survive in, like, high temperature and high pressure, or is it something else that causes, like, us from separating from other, like, micro animals? So if we just think about um, things like bacteria that is single cell, um, there is nothing structural that um, is necessarily different between these. The, uh, sometimes the membranes are a little different, but it's mostly the, the, there's nothing that protects the enzymes on the inside. So they actually feel the high temperatures, high pressures that the um, uh, that 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 you have on the outside. The reason, actually, one reason that we don't do well under high pressure, isn't the cells themselves, but it's things like our bones break, and so when you get to larger. Um, organisms, then your structure starts breaking down. Did that answer? はい、え、他にありますでしょうか。じゃあ、あの、奥の黒いマスクの。はい、ございます。えっと、極限状態だと、あの、捕食者も非食者もま食べる側も食べられる側もきっとなんか少ないんじゃないかなっていうふうに思います。そういった時にまどういった生態系があるのかなっていうのが気になりました。なんか僕たちと同じようなが多様な生態系があるのかそれとも彼らってい
they're pretty lonely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of bacteria. Um, I, I think that the way they eat in the cold is you know, things die, and then they just gradually fall down to the bottom, and the bacteria eat them. So there's, there's, not, there's no sunlight down there, so no photosynthesis, no plants. It's just well, dead things float downward, and they, or they eat each other. Um, near the hydrothermal vents, um, so I'm sure you know, but there, there is a remarkable diversity of life there. And there are predators and prey there. I think there, um, there are these tube worms and those crabs and all sorts of things. Um, be, I, because the thing in the hydrothermal vent, there's so much energy there. So the, there's energy, things coming out of the vent that provides energy. But in the cold ocean, huh, there's not, not much energy. Things are pretty boring there. <laughs> え、The, um, I think I understood. The enzymes are very similar in that they, they perform the same function, but they are slightly different chemically so that they can um, still work. Uh, the enzyme that we have been looking at, uh, there's microbes at the surface that are in the same genus, just a different species, as at the surface all the way down to the Mariana Trench. I know at least two different bacteria where there's a surface one and, a, and all different depths. So the organisms are close enough, so their proteins are close enough that they belong to the same species. Um, there's one... Um, enzyme that we've studied where um, I know the, the one, there's one at 220 atmospheres and another at 1,000 atmospheres, and there are only three changes between the, the two enzymes. So they're very similar in, in function, but they are just very slightly chemically different so they have this stability to be in that, those conditions. あ、はい、分かりました。もう一つ、酵素が似てるとなると、あの、構造がここのスライドにあるみたいに、えっと、ビカーケビティスで、こう、水圧を逃がしてるっていうことでよろしいでしょうか。So generally that is the case, but actually the very, in the very deepest, um, you start have to worrying about the proteins being squashed. So then they have specific hydrogen bonds to keep them from being squashed. But yes, if you look at surface versus deep, the, the ones deeper down have Slightly bigger cavities. You can't see it, but um, if you measure it, the volume is slightly bigger. いいですか。はい、他にありますか。後ろの二人いますか。前の方。はい。ありがとうございました。えっと極限環境。
、臨、脂質、臨脂質のような、脂質の方はあまり条件にはならないんでしょうか。あの、温度や圧力の。The two things to consider are the proteins and the phospholipids. DNA、uh, seems to be incredibly strong and robust. So you, usually the nucleic acids are okay. But、um, there is some changes in、uh, phospholipid com com、uh, composition, too, because they, they are.、Um, Uh, especially in the hydrothermal vents, the phospholipid lipid con,、um, uh, composition is different. Yeah, the other one. Thank you very much. <笑>タンパク質はすみません地球の生命の,その進化の中でどのくらいから重要な役割を担うようになったんでしょうか I'm not a specialist on,、uh... Evolution, but I think one of the things, even if you believe in an RNA world that RNA came first, the reason proteins are so important is that you can have, so there are 20 amino acids. So you can have many different combinations, and they have、um, different characteristics. They're hydrophobic, they're polar, they're charged, and they're just. Um, much more capable of having different kinds of chemistry than RNA is able to have. And I don't know when they came in, but、um, that's why I think they're so important. Thank you very much. Yes. 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 Thank you very much.